Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lorenzo Macorini, Professor of Structural Engineering at Imperial College, and I'm very pleased to welcome colleagues and friends from industry and academia to Imperial College to attend the Ermabi uh, workshop. So the workshop is a two day event organized by Imperial College, University of Leeds and University of Sheffield. It is chaired by Professor Matthew Gilbert from the University of Sheffield and myself. In the next two days, we are going to discuss uh, research outcomes on uh, masonry arch bridges. We are going to present and discuss uh, research obtained in the Ermabi project, uh, a project funded by UK government uh, via APSRC. So, as I said, the focus is uh, on masonry bridges. Uh, the research outcomes will include uh, a detailed uh, modeling, uh, results from physical tests at different scales, and uh, uh, assessment. So, um, I wanted just to provide some basic information, housekeeping information. So, today there are no plans. Um, on fire alarms, uh, so if the alarm sounds, please exit the building as quick as possible following the main staircase. So tea and coffee will be served um, in the area outside the lecture theater. And importantly, today, after the presentations, uh, you are invited uh, to the dinner, to the conference dinner, to the workshop dinner, with, which will be served at the Onisco restaurant, which is opposite to the main entrance of Imperial, a three minute walk uh, from here. So now uh, I leave the floor uh, to Matthew, who is going to elaborate on the motivation for these events and provide detailed schedule for the presentations. Thanks very much, uh, Lorenzo, and thanks uh, to everybody who's uh, come today. So uh, very, very welcome. So um, motivation for the event, uh, basically it's, a, it's an opportunity to, to bring people together, particularly people from industry and academia. Um, we've had um, a number of, of these uh, events over the last 10 or 15 years in the UK. Uh, I'm thinking of perhaps one at the University of Salford that Jonathan Hayes, Hayes uh, organised, wherever he is. Hi. Uh, it was very, very successful. I think uh, there's a danger that we end up being in, in silos, divorced from each other. So it's a really good opportunity to, to come together and, and listen to what each other are doing, what people each other are thinking, and, uh, and try to join up and, uh, and work uh, collectively uh, for the greater good. Um, in terms of the sort of specifics, uh, we know that there are lots and lots of uh, masonry bridges in the UK, um, also in, in other countries worldwide. They need to be uh, maintained, managed appropriately. Um, also, uh, and one of the speakers today is going to touch on this, the scope actually to revisit masonry bridges as a, a low embodied, embodied carbon um, form for bridges, uh, particularly stone masonry. If you've got some locally sourced uh, material, uh, perhaps it makes sense to actually form your bridge, your next bridge out of uh, stone masonry rather than, for example, reinforced concrete. However, um, though clearly these are long-lived structures, there are question marks. There's lots of things that we still don't fully understand. And as a result of that, um, I see, and probably many of you see, many examples of, of these bridges not being um, treated correctly, st very strange interventions, perhaps rash decisions, uh, uh, bridges replaced needlessly and so forth. So I think it's really important that we we, 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 we appreciate that um, and try to uh, improve our own understanding and also spread the message um, widely. Um, as Lorenzo has mentioned, this is um, an out, out, outgrowth of a, uh, a UK government funded project. Um, this event, uh, Free Universities, um, and the funder is uh, something called EPSRC, it's a, a government research council. And they've kindly um, provided funding both for our research and also for events such as um, such as this or, or additional funding to make sure that we can afford a, a very nice meal in the in the evening. Um, in terms of um, the programme, we didn't want to um, 
bombard you with 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 outcomes from one um, um, project, uh, the Amabi project. We also wanted to bring in voices from from industry and from 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 other academic institutions. So what you'll see is that we've uh, we've got a sort of mixture of presentations. Uh, on day one, there's a there's a slightly greater industry focus, and we've got John Shea from WSP and Brian Duguid from the uh, Net Zero Bridges Group, who are going to give some of their perspectives, as well as um, myself and Lorenza, who are going to be telling you about uh, certain aspects of the MRB uh, research project. And then it's going to come together at the end of the day with a panel discussion where hopefully we can uh, um, try and make sense of some of the things that we've uh, we've covered in the uh, in the earlier presentations. Um, tomorrow, uh, similarly, we've got a, a, a sort of mix of presentations, both from the Amabi project and also from colleagues from other institutions. So Enrico Tobaldi from University of Strathclyde, uh, Sinan Akizok, uh, Akizok uh, forgive me, Sinan, um, from the University of Oxford, and uh, Eva Calia from University of Catania in, in Italy. And similarly, we've got a panel discussion that, that's going to bring things together, hopefully, at the, the end of the day. So hopefully, um, we will have a very uh, productive and enjoyable uh, time together. And I'm very pleased that this room is air conditioned. Um, OK, so just a, just a bit, a bit about the format. So um, hopefully, um, speakers will, will um, leave around five minutes for uh, questions. I've got various signs that I've been issued with to try and enforce a bit of order if people get overzealous. Um, I guess coming from an academic background, uh, I'm, I'm personally, I think many of, of us in the academic uh, part of the MRB project are very keen particularly to hear the thoughts of practitioners. How can we um, um, effectively uh, help uh, improve uh, or enhance uh, uh, you know, the tools, methods that are used in, in practice. And, and, and that's definitely going to be a dialogue that hopefully we'll, we'll enter into today and tomorrow. And then we've talked about the panel discussion to hopefully um, uh, facilitate more in-depth um, discussion of, of, of the various um, issues that we're going to cover. Um, so I think without further ado, um, I'm going to um, invite the, the first of our two industry speakers um, Today, it's going to be John Shea from WSP, who's going to talk about um, code aspects uh, of what we do as engineers. I'm going to then come in after John and, and tell you a little bit more about the Amabi project, which is going to hopefully inform, um, inform you about what we uh, have been up to. It's not, just to, to stress, and I'll probably mention this again later, it's not a uh, a final outcome from the project. The project has actually got until June next year still to run. So it's been slightly delayed due to COVID um, issues, getting certain things done. Um, but it's a real opportunity for you to um, feed in at quite a pivotal time when we've still got a bit of time left to perhaps pivot in a direction that's going to be most valuable uh, to as many people. So anyway, without further ado, uh, John, if you want to just, just take to the stage. Okay. Excellent, thank you very much. So I'm John Shea from WSP and uh, big picture of me up there. And uh, as you can see, I'm on a few different kind of standards committees. So civil engineer involved in all sorts of different types of bridges, not just masonry and arches and tunnels and other types of structures. Um, and as well as doing kind of design and assessment, I've been quite heavily involved in development of standards as well and supporting the associated research um, such as this project. So what I'm going to do today is hopefully give a little bit of context for how projects such as this can kind of fit within the kind of standards frameworks that we have, recent changes and some, some forthcoming updates as well that we can expect in the world of of standards. 
But before I start with my masonry arches, I've got a picture of a dome. Does anyone know where this structure is? Rome, exactly. So I'm going to start off by talking about a dome. And uh, this is one that was um, that was built in the 16th century. And in 1742, they had some cracking and some distress in it. And the Pope was quite concerned about this. So he he ordered a survey to be done. And when they did the survey, as well as carrying out the survey, they did some mathematical calculations and structural analyses, which was quite kind of groundbreaking for the time uh, in order to try and understand the cause of the distress and also to try and kind of make some recommendations for what measures could be taken to, to uh, improve the situation. Um, so that that's great. However, pretty controversial. And you can see a quote there from the iStruct T document appraisal of existing structures saying that it caused a furore. And I'm going to read that this out because it's quite a good quote. One comment at the time stated, if it were possible to design and build St Peter's Dome without mathematics, and especially without the newfangled mathematics of our time, it would also be possible to restore it without the aid of mathematics, math mathematicians and mathematics. Michelangelo knew no mathematics and yet was able to build the dome. Heaven forbid that the calculation is correct, for in that case, not a minute would have passed before the entire structure would have collapsed. So you can see there's, uh, there's a lot of parallels there between the sort of things that were being discussed then and what we're going to be talking about now in terms of assessment of structures. And OK, it's not an arch, it's a dome. There's a lot of a lot of parallels in terms of the way that the structure behaves. It's a 3D structure. Um, there's some there's a relationship between the cracking in it and the ultimate capacity, which is controversial and not that well understood. There's the uh, potentially um, there's also uh, the need to get some kind of information from the way that the structure is actually behaving in service and in situ uh, and to try and correlate that with some theoretical calculations and analyses. Um, and this, these are the challenges that we continue to face. Also decisions about how complex to take the analysis in order to, to come to a robust and reliable uh, conclusion. So. Um, how does this relate to masonry arches? Well, the challenges that we face with masonry arches are fairly similar. We've, we've got a lot of these structures in the UK that often quite kind of significant heritage structures as well. So we want to try and keep them in use. Um, but we need to understand the level of safety there. We need to understand what the limit states are, how they can be modelled, and what's the corresponding load levels that could be associated with those, those limit states. We need to know what data we need to collect from the structure, the way it's behaving, and we need to understand the causes and the consequences of any cracking and distress in the structure. And then how do we combine that information from the structure with the theoretical analyses? How do we need to decide which type of analysis to use? Do we have to do a very, very simple analysis or do we go quite complex? And what management recommendations do we need to make as a result of the assessment? These are all not easy questions to answer, so we need some help. We need a framework for how to do this, and this is where the standards and the guidance come in. So I'm going to be talking about some recent developments in standards and guidance. Um, this is a timeline of some of the documents that have been produced over the past 25, 26 years or so. Um, going from the left, 1997, which was the previous uh, version of the documents in the design manual for roads and bridges, um, BD21 and BA16, those have now been withdrawn. Um, and I'll talk about that later. Uh, we've also got some Syria documents here. There was a Syria C656 in 2006, which was about uh, masonry arch bridges, particularly. Um, condition appraisal and remedial treatment. We've got CS454, which I was involved in the authoring of and which we'll talk about shortly, which replaced BD21 and BA16. That covers the assessment of all highway bridges, not just not just masonry arches, um, but it has a, a dedicated section on masonry arch assessment. Um, and we have some new developments in across Europe, 
which is related to how how we can assess and appraise existing structures. Again, not specifically about masonry arches, but if we wanted to apply euro codes to existing structures, how would we do that? And there's some developments which I'll talk about as well happening in that sphere as well. And then we also have recent document Sirius C800, which is particularly relevant about which is, provides guidance on the assessment of masonry arch bridges. And of course, this is just a, a selection. There are various other guidance documents um, out there as well. And as we go into the future, there will be there will be more developments, which I'll also talk about later. To start with, I'm going to talk a little bit about CS454. This is part of the design manual for roads and bridges, the DMRB, which is produced by National Highways and it is uh, used by a, a, quite a wide variety of different authorities um, across the UK. Um, so that's the reason I'm focusing on it is, you know, the although different clients have their own requirements, very many of them refer to this document. Um, it's it replaced BD21 and BA16. There was a big project to update the whole of the DMRB, which is a very large suite of documents covering the whole kind of life cycle of, of structures. And this was updated as part of that project. And one of the purposes of doing that was to bring everything up into a consistent style to make it consistent in its content, um, but also to Bring the documents up to date if that could be done at the same time and this is this is the document where there were some significant technical updates to that to that uh, document and it sets out the principles for all bridge assessments so what's the basis how do you do the partial factors what loading do you apply and also this concept of increasing levels of assessment you can start off with quite a simple assessment analysis and assessment uh, methodology, um, but you can then use increasing levels of sophistication if you need to in order to demonstrate that there's sufficient resistance in the structure. And that's where you can get into some some higher level assessments, which uh, which can be needed in some cases. We've got the traffic load models there and we've got content on specifically on masonry arch assessment. And it was revised in 2020 to refer to that Syria document, Syria C800, which has some kind of further methods in there which can be useful for masonry arch assessment. So you can see the different sections of the document. Um, and if you are doing a masonry arch assessment, then you're obviously going to be using section seven, which is all about assessment of masonry arches, but you'll also be using many of the other sections of the document as well in order to know how to put the different loads together and to calculate resistances, do the analysis. Um, so it's the whole document really that is needed. Um, there are some updates in CS454, which came along in 2019. Um, which have kind of improved the situation in terms of masonry arches. So these are some of the things I want to highlight. So first of all, reductions in traffic loads. So there was a change to the traffic load model, which meant that if you were talking about a single vehicle in each lane with impact, which is where you've got traffic moving at speed, um, then you could consider wider notional traffic lanes uh, of three metres instead of two and a half metres. That meant that if you've got a carriageway of between five and six metres, you've now got just one lane of traffic considered in that situation rather than two lanes. And so that obviously brings down the loading uh, quite significantly in that case. But it depends on the carriageway width. Um, but also for all structures, there's also reductions in the conservatism that was in the previous document by considering beneficial effects of road surface quality and traffic flow. So for a lot of these masonry arches where you might have low traffic flow, you can get a reduction in the load that wasn't there previously. And if you've got a good surface quality um, as well, you get further reduction. So you can see in the document here, you've got this three metre lane width where you've got the single vehicle in each lane case. If you've got a case where you've got convoy of vehicles in each lane, it's still two and a half metres. 
but if this one is the one that's critical, then that gives you quite a good reduction. You've got reduction in the impact factor and you've got reduction in the traffic flow factor. The other change that was brought in was to do with partial factors. Previously, there was a very high partial factor when you on the traffic when it was a masonry arch. So you applied a partial factor of 3.4 in the old document BD21 instead of 1.5 for all other types of structure. And the reason that there was a very high partial factor on traffic for masonry arches was because it also included an allowance for the impact factor, which normally would have been dealt with separately, and an implicit factor to avoid the load causing distress to the arch. What we've done is we've separated, we've taken those out of the partial factor, so they don't really belong in the partial factor, um, really. Um, so we've now got the same partial factor for traffic on all types of structures. So it brings masonry arches into a more consistent approach for all structures. And it also allows you to look at these other things and take the conservatism out of them um, where possible. So in terms of the different limit states, we've got the ultimate limit state, but also the risk that the loading causes distress to the arch. And in CS454, we've got a kind of a default approach in there, which is similar to that old rule of thumb that was in the previous version, um, that now comes out at this kind of minimum live load capacity factor of 1.2 for normal traffic. And that's equivalent to the old rule of thumb saying that that load to cause distress is about half of the ultimate capacity for a masonry arch. So it's obviously a very kind of broad, uh, assumption there which isn't always going to be accurate um, and for that reason there's also now a reference to Sirius C800 I'll talk about Sirius C800 shortly uh, which has an alternative approach to this limit state which is referred to as a permissible limit state in in the Syria document so this is where where you see it in CS454 and here is the reference to Syria C800 and we can see that it says you either use this equation or another suitable approach and down here it says that this is an alternative approach to satisfy the clause. So putting that all together um, you can see that if you have poor road service and high traffic flow then you get a 5% reduction in the minimum live load capacity you need now but if you have a good road surface and low traffic flow, you get 23% reduction. So through these updates, you've got a reduced conservatism, improved assessment results of between 5% and 23%. But then you've also got further improvements of up to 40% possible if you've got certain carriageway widths that mean that you've now got fewer lanes to consider compared with before. So these changes have meant that you're more likely to, to improve the result of your assessment um, through these updates. There's some guidance on structural analysis um, and the methodology for the structural analysis, you know, the different types of analysis doesn't go into too much detail on how you do the structural analysis in this document because this just sets out the requirements um, being a standard. Um, but it does talk about how you could include the condition defects in your assessment, either directly through the analysis model or indirectly through the use of condition factors, kind of more traditional way that it used to be done. Um, but it does mean that now it's clearer that if you are explicitly analysing the failure mechanisms using in the way that is now possible with up-to-date software, then those condition factors don't necessarily need to apply. Um, we've also got. Um, some clearer guidance on the principles analysis, which is more consistent with the sort of software packages that are in use now compared with in the 1990s. Um, it's there was an aim when it was updated to continue to allow simple analyses, not to kind of force people to do more complex analyses, um, but also to make sure that if there was some concerns about the validity of some simpler methods, then that was controlled. And for that reason, there are now new restrictions on the use of this modified MEXI method, which is quite a kind of old fashioned method of uh, assessing 
uh, bridges, um, which now mean that these ones that are highlighted here were kind of new in the development of CS454, but they're based on guidance that was previously in those documents, including Syria 656. The other thing that was done with the DMRB was updated was uh, the processes around gathering feedback and updating the standards more efficiently, particularly minor updates and incremental updates rather than the full kind of major rewrites of the standard could be done more efficiently through these, these processes that were introduced. So if you do have feedback on any of the DMRB documents, including CS454, you can do that through the website where you get the document and that should enable that to be updated much more efficiently and quickly than it used to be. So we've mentioned Syria C800 a few times. This is a guidance document, whereas CS454 sets out the requirements um, of the overseas organisations. CS454 doesn't really give you very much in order to help you understand how, how most of arches work. Um, and how to analyze them. And so this is where documents such as Syria C800 are really, really useful. Um, because you know this this kind of brings together a whole wealth of knowledge uh, and guidance that will help that will help uh, engineers to to make good decisions on how they how they do the assessments. Um, and I know you probably can't read that, but that's just to give you a flavour of the breadth of content that's that's in this document, and it, it's kind of split across two parts so that all of the uh, appendices and case studies are uh, included as well. So, I mentioned already the CS454 is really about the requirements, whereas this is this is about the kind of guidance which gives you kind of some really useful information on how to do it. And it means that the quality of the advice that you provide to the client at the end of the assessment is going to be a better quality kind of recommendations on, on what to do next. Um, if you've taken into account the way that the arch is behaving and you've used an appropriate uh, method of assessment. So the one of the key changes, I guess, the, that was kind of introduced through this document is this permissible limit plate. I'm not going to talk about it in depth, but just to kind of let you know that this is this is there um, and it is aiming to more directly and explicitly look at the way the art behaves at that limit state that relates to the cracking in the in the in the, uh, in the arch. Um, OK, I'm going to move on to Eurocodes. So I mentioned that I've been involved in development of Eurocodes. The Eurocodes, first generation of Eurocodes came in in 2010, and this is what we use for design of new structures. Um, and although they mention existing structures a couple of times, they don't really include the content to enable you to assess existing structures um, yet. Um, and for that reason, we continue to use documents like CS454 and the DMRB when we're looking at existing structures rather than try and apply Eurocodes, which are really intended for design of new structures. However, Eurocodes are being updated at the moment. It's a big project to update the Eurocodes. And one of the one of the things that are being introduced in the second generation Eurocodes, which we'll start to see over the coming years, is content relating to assessment of existing structures and retrofitting of existing structures. So this is something that we can expect to see quite soon. I've been involved in some of the some of the project teams that are working on these aspects. There's one document that has been published already. This is a pre-normative document which is effectively voluntary. So you know you don't have to it's, it's not standard, I don't have to use it. Um, but it gives you a flavour of what is likely to be coming in, in terms of the Eurocodes, in terms of how you might apply the basis of design and the powerful factors and the different design situations that are set out in EN 1990 for an existing structure. It doesn't contain anything specifically about masonry arches, um, but it does give you that framework for how the different basic variables 
an analysis could be applied where you've got data, you're combining data from an existing structure with the, uh, the, the basis of the assessment. So that will become a part two of EN 1990 in the second generation, which will be coming over the next five years or so. Um, we've also got other Euro codes which will have content. So all the different material Euro codes cover how the different materials work. EN 1992 for concrete, which will probably see the updated version reasonably soon now, um, includes an annex on existing structures uh, that tells you how to apply those design rules for an existing structure, but for concrete. Um, however, not all the other material parts have done the same. This is just something that is in the concrete code. So it will be some time before we get a complete uh, set of how do you determine resistance for all different types of structures in the Euro code. It might be the third generation where you see that, who knows. Um, so, the bottom line is for UK masonry art structures, we'll continue to use CS454, supplemented by guidance documents such as Sirius C800, and those will re remain the key documents for us, I think, for the, for the foreseeable future. But the kind of framework for how things are going to be done in bridge assessment might well be evolving. And the DMRB might, will be aligned more and more with that European uh, approach. So I want to wrap up now, which is the conclusion. I've mentioned a few times about how there are some tricky decisions to make in terms of when you do structural assessments uh, for bridges. You've got to try and be safe in the way that you're doing the assessment because we don't want collapses, but we've also got to avoid unnecessary conservatism uh, because we've got to keep these structures in use if we can. And um, there's not an unlimited budget to, to replace structures or, or uh, strengthen them. And um, we can't always rely on design standards like Eurocodes that are intended for new materials and new construction methods when we're dealing with old structures and old materials. Uh, and so, is you know, we do need to think about how these structures are behaving. And even the simplest structures, simplest, uh, can involve a complex analysis if you've got 3D behaviour and you've got fail failure mechanisms that are not necessarily predicted by a simple analysis. So the standards set out the requirements. They don't tell you how to do the analysis. We need also an understanding of the structure and how it behaves. And this is where the guidance documents are really useful. And they give us that understanding of the, the relevant limit states, particularly. Okay, thank you very much. That was done in 2020. So we've got 2022, was it? Thank you. So the, the latest version we've got on the website now, that has been corrected. Um, so I think I've got, I had a screenshot of it, but yeah, it's now uh, 1.8. Uh, I think, I can't remember, I think before it said 1.5, wasn't it? Which was unfortunately. A mistake, but yeah, that has been that has been updated. Before you consolidated the single, double, and triple axles nicely from what was in Annex A of the twenty one, um, very much more clear. I think what you've covered, but. There's no mention of the in the old BB21 in Annex A it included you know, triple axles that go to two, two vehicles and other, other axle combinations, mm. which we've often found to be critical. So how come they went to include in 454? Was that the long term for solid and an ambition? But lots of axle and annex A at the 21 that never made it into Yeah. Uh so the intention with CS454 was to take what was there and to more clearly 
expressed what the requirements were. Um, not to necessarily change that particular aspect, um, but I think when you looked at the combination of BD21 and BA16, um, there were some inconsistencies um, previously. Um, and so what we've, and also some, some duplication as well. So, so what was done was to try and kind of consolidate that content into something that was kind of more easily digestible. But the kind of the purpose of it, as you've kind of alluded there, is to kind of represent the, the critical um, cases that represent all of the different vehicles that are that are up there. Yeah. And um, so in terms of when you look at the different vehicles that are set out in Appendix B of CSY4, um, you know, you can see how some of those translate into the critical cases. I think the work that was done some time ago to convert those vehicle models into critical axle cases that need to be considered for masonry arches was how we ended up with what was in the BA16 tables. Um, so we didn't kind of repeat that work, um, if you like. So I think the, the, the principle is that these are kind of simplified cases that represent the range of vehicles that are possible on the on the highways. Um, so if the if you think there is a more critical case than what is presented there, then that could be a challenge to what's in there. So it could be something that you could, you know, put to Napa Highways and we could we could investigate that. And uh, if you think that there's a there's an error, then that's something that we could we could yeah, definitely look at. Yeah, in, in BD21, the text always pointed it to Annex A and that, that the single double and triples at the bottom, but then other, um, you know, the rigid three, four axles, you know, the, you know, the, uh, the tractor vehicles and all sorts, rigid threes and fours. But then in section seven of 454, it just refers to the table which contains the single, double and triples. Yeah. And as I say, we often found some of those three axle rigids were, were more critical yeah. than the, the single double triples. Um, it's, it's a bit of a, something we've been discussing at work a lot recently about technically 454 is therefore just omitted a tranche of vehicles or axles that can be more critical for action. Yeah. Interesting. Well, I'd be interested to kind of hear more about that. Okay. You know, so do you know get in touch and we can look into that in more detail. Hello, well, Dave Cousins from Accolade Measurement. Thanks very much for a great presentation. Um, just want to ask about where the loads are reduced in BS 454 compared to previous standards. Has that led to an analysis of looking at bridges that have previously been assessed and now might be uprated, supposedly capable of more capacity than they were before? I mean, it can do. I mean, I think the the general the general process for um, the general process for doing initiating assessments in the DMRB, it kind of starts off with a structural review and it's that structural review can be triggered by either it's been, you know, a certain time period since the last time one was done, or there's been something which has been observed on the structure, which is kind of triggered uh, an early structural review. And that could then mean that you could just make a decision whether or not to do a new assessment or not on the structure but normally that would be um that would be a concern that the previous assessment was no longer valid for the structure in its current state uh, if you if you've done an assessment previously and we're now saying that actually there's probably a bit more in the structure than what that assessment did then that wouldn't necessarily need to trigger a new assessment unless uh, there was concern about you know the kind of traffic management on the structure not being needed anymore, for instance. Um, so if you've got um, if you've got some sort of interim measures in place on the structure, such as weight restriction, um, then that would typically be reviewed uh, anyway to see if it was still required. And that could be something that you could look at if uh, if we think that actually 
there might not be a need for it anymore because if you apply the new standard, you could get a good result. So that's that is there's certainly some possibilities there in that situation, I'd say. John, on the flip side of the same thing. Yeah. Do you have any concern that given that capacity has increased across all bridges, and yet we know very well that the assessments are not universally conservative in terms of damage under service load, that we would as a result see more damage under service load from assessment to CS four five four than we did hitherto. Um I don't, yeah, that's an interesting question. It's an interesting question. I think I need to think about that a little bit more. But I think one of the we know that historically the the methods that have been used about cracking under under service load um, have been fairly approximate um, and based on kind of rule, rules of thumb. Um, and yet, in many cases, it seems to work. Um, what we're now finding is that we've got these other options, such as in CS8. C800, sorry, sorry, C800, which which give us kind of alternatives, which might kind of look at it in a bit more uh, explicit way. Um, so at least there are those options now. Um, the other thing, in terms of the kind of flip side to what we were talking about, is that it's not universally the changes have not universally gone in that direction of making things less conservative. We're also now saying that if you've got a shorter span structure of less than five metres, um, and that has previously been assessed using the MEXI, modified MEXI method, we're now saying that should no longer be used. So there's definitely possibilities out there for structures that have previously been assessed, but if you assess them now, they wouldn't pass. So again, I think that structural review process of saying, is there a concern about this structure in terms of the way it's been assessed previously, is that assessment still valid in terms of uh, going forward? And if there is a concern, either because of the changes in the standards or because of the way that the structure is performing in service, then it could be that that triggers a new assessment and you might need to do things in a little bit different way in order to look into those issues a little bit further, I would say. Support and uh, it will be uh, well addressed in George John's and Greece to say questions at the uh, tea and coffee break. Unless you get that brush off from Jabora. Yeah, no, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be here the rest of the day. Thanks very much, John. Next speaker will actually be uh, my good self. The, um, just um, going in a little bit more detail into the um, MRB project. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what we want to do now is just provide um, an overview, and that's going to hopefully inform um, the, um, um, the sort of. Uh, um, the future presentations that are going to basically delve into a bit more detail into into a range of uh, uh, of aspects of activity. So, first one is going to provide uh, just a, a sort of big picture view. Um, so, first thing is um, we know, as I've said before, lots of these bridges around they need to be assessed, uh, and uh, they, there is also scope to build these bridges in the future. Um, however. Um, We've tended to model these structures from a from an analysis point of view, from an assessment point of view, as two dimensional structures. But we know that many structures have three D de details, so they could be skew. Um, if they're not skew, then they're typically subject to three D patterns of loading, and they may uh, very often respond in a three D manner. So there's lots of uh, uncertainties with regard to the three D behaviour when it comes to masonry bridges. Secondly, and I think this is something that, that, that John has actually touched on already, um, there's a lack of um, parity on the nature of the assessment you get, particularly when you use a simple uh, assessment tool. Some of the assumptions built into those tools are non-conservative. Um, and uh, the danger is 
that if you're trying to adopt a multi-level assessment framework where um, for a quick analysis, a quick assessment, you use a simple tool, necessarily that simple tool has to be um, at least conservative. And the expectation is that when you go to higher levels of assessment, that you um, you get a more accurate uh, prediction of, of assessed capacity um, that is potentially less conservative. At the moment, using certainly this sort of the BD21 type approach, um, you will sometimes find that um, you do a, a simple analysis and then you do a refined level two or level three analysis and you end up with uh, a lower assessed capacity. So this is clearly something that's unsatisfactory and uh, uh, deserves uh, some attention. So in summary, we need a better understanding um, of the 3D behaviour of masonry bridges, and um, hopefully this can inform uh, development of new methods and hopefully, as I mentioned, a new uh, multi-level assessment framework, which can be used with confidence by, by engineers. So from where um, we started, from a sort of a UK government funded research perspective, um, clearly there have been a number of uh, research projects um, in the area of masonry arch bridges over the past uh, uh, a few decades. Um, project that finished um, in the, uh, I guess, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the 2010s uh, looked at this uh, issue of permissible limit state. So the, 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 um, the, the issue that was um, the focus of that project was that very often um, bridge owners would tell us that uh, a bridge has quite high assessed capacity, but actually is clearly struggling under the action of repeated you know, HGVs going to and fro um, towards a, a new industrial estate, for example. So there's this, uh, this, this issue that clearly service loads were not necessarily being uh, being dealt with very effectively by current methods. And so uh, the outcome of that project was uh, this permissible limit state, or, uh, or, or one outcome was at least, uh, permissible limit state, which we've defined as a state beyond which progressive load-induced degradation will occur. I feel it's a very useful tool for, for a bridge owner. Um, um, it's, uh, you know, just just as useful um, as uh, the ultimate load capacity um, that's historically been used uh, in this field. Um, so standards, um, John's covered this, I won't go in, into, into, into much detail, but there's, in addition to the, um, the uh, National Highways, formerly Highways England documents, uh, there's also the Network Rail documents, which uh, um, haven't been updated for, for some years. I'm not sure if anybody from Network Rail in the room can tell me what the plans are there. Last time I inquired, there were no immediate plans to to update those. Anybody? Yeah, Kapu? It's still okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's the, the, the highways, uh, sorry, the, um, the, the Network Rail document was very closely aligned with BD21. BD21 has been superseded by CS454, so I think maybe there's a need to, to revisit the, the Network Rail code. Now, this is the backdrop to the project. So the project began um, it, back in, in late 2019, um, and it involved, as I mentioned, three universities, Sheffield, Leeds and Imperial, and uh, a, a, a large number of uh, partners from from industry. Um, the project uh, isn't complete. It's, it's going to run until um, the middle of next year. Um, and one of the reasons why we want to talk to you now is so that we can uh, hopefully um, focus our final efforts in a way which is most beneficial um, uh, to the wider world, as I mentioned earlier. In terms of the um, the way the project was structured, um, there's basically sort of three three uh, um, the hierarchy with three, three three levels, not the same as levels of assessment. To confuse you, but we're basically we're looking to develop greater understanding. Um, so we, for example, have a much better feel for. Um, why a certain three-dimensional failure mode is, is being triggered in one case and not in another. 
Um, and to achieve that, we've got detailed modeling and experiments working very, very uh, hand in hand effectively. So the idea is that we can validate um, high fidelity models uh, on the one hand and also simple models on the other, but particularly high fidelity models so that then we can apply those with confidence to a wide range of uh, different scenarios. And then those tools can be used to, for example, um, inform the development of practical tools such as the uh, multi-level assessment framework you can see on the middle level there, um, and also um, inform the development of, um, of much more uh, convenient, fast-running um, analysis tools. Then the bottom level, um, it's something that we're particularly looking to uh, to get feedback from uh, at the workshop uh, today and tomorrow. Um, how can this then feed into to impacts for the greater good? So that's the structure. Um, in terms of the overall approach, um, I try, I'm trying to distill this down. So I, key key area is is 3D response, um, and I think two strands of activity. One is multi-level assessment, and the other is understanding 3D behaviour. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more about what I mean by um, by that in the in the in the case of these two strands. So. Um, Multi-level assessment. This is um, a, an extract from Sirius C800. Um, what do we mean by multi-level assessment? Well, um, typically we're talking about level one assessment being a, a relatively simple um, analysis done with a two-dimensional analysis tool um, using simplified representation of, for example, loading, um, Potentially geometry and uh, well, geometry is measured, but um, materials um, you know, assumed. We're not we're not we're not uh, taking core samples and all the rest of it. Um, not that necessarily we want to be doing that um, um, particularly extensively anyway. Um, for the longevity of the structure, but and then it basically goes up level two, more sophisticated. And level three is, is looking at uh, a more comprehensive um, analysis basically capable of capturing all the key aspects of behavior. So that's the, the multi-level um, assessment um, um, statement of, of the multi-level multi assessment levels in Sirius 800. There are various other documents which have slightly different takes on the situation. So what we were looking to do in um, the Amari project is really um, start at a high level of, of uh, a very sophisticated analysis and then we can use that developed validated tool to inform um, the for example model factors um, effective widths and so forth that are then usable at the um, lower levels um, Burnley I would argue when we really understand the full detail of, of the phenomenon that's going on, can we assess um, in how uh, justifiable the, the, the very simplified uh, uh, models of those, um, those things are? So that's the first, the first strand. Second strand, um, thinking about, about 3D behaviour, if we, if we just step back first of all to, um, to where we were at the end of this previous EPSSC project, Deliberately in that previous EPC project, we weren't looking at 3D behavior at all. In fact, we um, we built a series of arches in a in a large fish tank, and and Levy from the University of Salford is in is in the audience, who was uh, responsible for doing many of those of those tests. What we're trying to do is deliberately um, model as close to a two dimensional um, bridge structure as we could. So we could really, really carefully and clearly understand all the interactions that happened on a two-dimensional um, level. Um, however, um, although we looked at the arch barrel and we looked at the effects of the uh, the backfill when it comes to sort of spreading passive resistance self weight, we didn't, for example, get a chance to look at backing, and we also um, didn't look, for example, at um, the effects of spandrel walls. Now. Um, in a, a narrow real bridge, um, we might have vacuum, we might have spandrel walls, but we still get effectively a two-dimensional um, 
response. So what we wanted to do in this project before we moved on to 3D was to actually properly characterise the effects of all these different components which we hadn't had a chance to, to look at uh, in more depth. And uh, here's, a, here's um, a slide um, uh, produced by uh, Serena Amodia, who's who will be talking tomorrow. Um, uh, she's talking about um, tests tomorrow, but these are some numerical model studies that she, she was involved in, where what we're doing is we're actually splitting out um, the different components of a bridge that contribute to load carrying capacity if we get a, a primarily two-dimensional response. And actually, you can model the walls and the, and the, and the, and the soil separately, and you can add up those um, different um, numbers and get the, uh, a, a good representation of, of what we saw in the lab some years ago when we did test bridges like that. So what we then need to do, though, is, is look at the behavior of, of a, a truly three-dimensional uh, structure um, and look at how that responds. And clearly, um, the difference we, we get between this 3D narrow response and 3D wide is due to the different nature of the mobilized um, failure mode. And that's something that we um, clearly uh, wanted to focus on in this, in this project. So, um, final thing on that overall approach, sorry, it's a slightly wordy slide, but it's two strands, multi-level assessment, first um, stage, validated high fidelity model, apply that to um, explore the parameter space, develop partial factors and so forth for use in, in lower levels of assessment. And the other complementary strand is trying to get a better handle of 3D behavior. So we use uh, medium scale tests to um, understand the effects of individual components, such as spanner walls, for example. Um, and then we, uh, we gradually uh, extend the scope of those to encompass properly three dimensional um, modes. And we use that to help inform the development of, of modeling tools that are capable of, of, of capturing those um, key features of the response. OK, so that's the sort of uh, that's, that's, that was the plan. Um, and I originally had this as um, the title of uh, as MRB outcomes, but I think we're we, we, we rather, than, rather than outcomes, we, we don't have definitive outcomes in, in large numbers. We have um, a statement of where we've got to. And uh, as I mentioned, we're very keen to hear from you uh, where you would like us to get to in the next um, half two-thirds of a year or so. Um, just um, um, slightly um, um, changing that previous uh, diagram I showed, um, expressing it as a, a jigsaw puzzle. Um, these are different, different aspects. So the understanding at the, in blue, practical tools in green and impact in red. We just look through each of these in turn, starting with the uh, experimental work, uh, what have we actually done in terms of develop um, test capability? Well, we've got now a medium scale test capability. And I think um, to date, we've probably constructed around 100 bridges in this, uh, this tank that you can see on the left hand side. And the idea is that we can very much more rapidly um, explore the parameter space using a medium scale rig than the full-scale rig on the right. Um, on the other hand, the full-scale rig um, is a much more realistic representation of the bridges that we see in the field. So that's also extremely uh, useful. And we'll see more detailed presentations on both the medium-scale and the large-scale uh, testing that's been carried out, I think, at 9 and 9.30 uh, tomorrow morning, respectively. Um, so the other aspect is, is, to, is to use the, um, the, these experiments to inform detailed modelling. Um, and these, these models um, need to be capable of, of capturing these complex 3D modes of response. But also one of the things that we wanted to do was also um, 
be capable of, of, of modeling effects of repeated learning. So an awful lot of work has been, been done in that area. And again, there'll be a presentation uh, tomorrow which will ex explain uh, what, what some of the, uh, the outcomes from this, this work have been today. Um, next level, um, I'm just looking at, at, at practical tools. Um, first of all, rapid 3D analysis. Um, we're looking at um, various different techniques. Um, so rigid block analysis. So this is, um, those of you aware of the, um, the, the, the limit state ring software, it's using the same kind of uh, approach, but extending that to 3D so that we can model these, um, these three-dimensional failure modes uh, as well as the two-dimensional ones. And we've also been looking at more, more novel approaches using a technique called discontinuity optimization, which we've basically used, for example, in the past for modeling yield line failure mechanisms in reinforced concrete slabs and also um, failure mechanisms in, in geotechnical structures. So the idea is there, it, we don't need to model every individual masonry unit. We can we can effectively model it in a in a, in a sort of smeared a sort of macro format. Um, and a slight a slight oddity, uh, we've also um, made available uh, recently um, access to um, a, a physics engine model. And the idea with this is that you can play around with um, three dimensional forms, look at different failure mechanisms, and the idea is really to demystify. Um, these three-dimensional failure mechanisms. This particular tool is uh, less accurate in terms of the, um, the load factor, so it doesn't actually give you a load factor. Um, it just gives you um, a, a, a mode of response. So it's using the same kind of techniques as uh, you'll find in, in, in computer games, basically. The fast-running interactive um, exploration, and you can uh, apply loading and also um, move supports and other things. And if you look at the Amabi website, I've, I posted a link uh, last night that allows you to uh, play around with that tool. Um, just, just one other thing I just mentioned. So the nice thing about having funding from the government is that we can, we can try lots of things. One of the downsides of the rigid block method is that by default, you don't have information about how the, the forces are being, um, being transmitted. So here we're using something called thrust left oscillation. Um, it's published in a paper earlier this year. Um, and what you can do is, is actually see how those forces um, are carried in a, um, either an assemblage of, of masonry blocks or actually in a, in a, in a more monolithic uh, um, sense. So you can get, uh, that's your conventional looking thrust lines, or you can get more detailed um, visualizations like you see here. This is a two dimensional um, representation, clearly, but the same technique could be applied in, in 3D as well. Um, so that's a, a little uh, flavor. Um, in terms of uh, multi level assessment, um, I guess what we've been mostly focusing on is particularly the right-hand side, so these detailed models, making sure these are validated, but also the simpler 3D tools you can see in the middle. And then the, um, the current work is, is trying to link these tools back down to much simpler analysis via things like partial facts and effective width. And um, Lorenzo will be talking in a bit more detail about this um, uh, later today. And then lastly, uh, impact. Um, C800 was mentioned. Primarily that C800 document relates to the previous EPC project that I referred to, carried out uh, as a collaboration between the Universities of Sheffield and Salford. However, we did manage to, um, for example, build in assessment level dependent load effects factors, which uh, kind of effectively laying the ground for, for what we want to do in this current project. At the moment, the factors that are written into that document are based on uh, our experience, but there's a lot of scope to make them uh, more refined in the light of some of these uh, 
well, the, the detailed um, uh, work we're, 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 we're doing in terms of the multi-level assessment framework. But you can see what we currently have on the ultimate limit state, the um, gamma F3 factor, which is effectively sort of global uh, factor that's applied, um, it's applying a 1.2 factor to reduce the likelihood of these simple uh, assessment tools, which often include um, non-conservative assumptions to reduce the likelihood of us giving you an unsafe um, estimation of um, capacity. And then as um, John mentioned, uh, we've, we've now got, in addition to the ULS, we've got this PLS um, 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 permissible limit state condition, which uh, we need to satisfy as well. There's separate calculations and, and, you know, in some cases we'll find that the ULS is, is critical. In other cases, we'll find that the PLS is critical. So we're moving away from the one size fits all approach of, of, of previous codes where we effectively just apply the factor to the ULS capacity to account for, for service load effects. Um, also, we've been working with um, um, a spin up company uh, from the University of Sheffield, Limit State, who, who, who developed the Limit State Ring software on incorporating um, our, our 3D modeling capability into the Limit State Ring software. It's currently in a prototype form, um, uh, but we'll see how, how that develops and, and whether that's something that we made available. Um, uh, to a wider audience in due course, but look, looking fairly promising today. So that's um, most of what I want to say. Um, I think rather than just having general questions, I've actually I asked a specific question, um, but please do, do ask me general questions as well. How should we focus our efforts in terms of project outcomes? So. You don't yet know all the detail, but just from this point, what you've seen so far, what 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 could our focus be? Um, and and if you say that uh, you know everything we've been done in the last few years has been uh, not worthwhile, and we should do something entirely different in the next six months or so, then that's really not not uh, not viable. But if if you have some uh, some useful uh, constructive um, statements, then we're really really keen to hear those. So that, concludes my presentation and uh, do you want to share, share me? Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Matthew, for the presentations. Any questions from the floor? Sorry, me again. Um, did your research look at different degrees of skew, Matthew? So could you tell us, did your, did your research tell us at what degree of skew do these 3D failure mechanisms become critical rather than the 2D, you know, the normal failure mechanisms? I, I mean, that, that's, that's still, that's, that's in the, in the um, to-do pile. In, in the current ongoing pile. I don't have a definitive um, number, but that's something that um, um, renders models um, that he's going to talk about later uh, really really useful um so do now i don't want to say it's it's, it's 22.8 degrees i've, I've like read it somewhere it was 22.5 and <laughs> bribe always had in my head but i wondered if your research yeah i mean that, that, that number that, that down. something that, that we you know it, it, it clearly um i think we should make a note of that um Arenda, it's something that's clearly it would be very worthwhile to to make sure we clearly express at the end of the project <laughs> Um, I was, uh, Owen Brono, uh, Amy, um, I was curious to know, um, at level one, we don't tend to do any sort of soil ground investigations. Um, we tend to use sometimes the standard values that are default in the, in the software. Um, when you're doing the 3D uh, lab models, um, I was curious when you're trying to simplify that in the tool, uh, in the limit state tool, for example, how important do you think it is when we're using that tool to gather more information from uh, the ground itself and the site conditions 
just very conscious that the lab um, conditions that you're using there might differ quite significantly on site. And I'm wondering how much value it would be to do further investigations. Yes, so, I mean, I'm thinking particularly of the um, previous project, one of, the, one of the, the big outcomes of that was that, uh, well, it's been, been widely known that um, the specific characteristics of the soil can govern ultimate limit state, you know, so they're very, very important. However, for permissible, permissible limit state, I can say, I shouldn't have, we shouldn't have coined a, 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 an unpronounceable expression, but anyway, a PLS, um, it's, mu they're, they're, it's much less sensitive to the, um, the properties. And if you actually follow the uh, the Sirius C800 guidance, you'll find that generally your results will be less sensitive to um, whether your angle of friction is, you know, 45 degrees or, you know, 42 degrees or whatever, uh, or even 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 lower than that. I mean, if you put if you put in crazily low uh, angles of friction, then if you actually do a simple bearing capacity um, calculation, you'll find that your vehicle you know, won't even get as far as the bridge because it will, um, it will, it will dig into the into the um, into the road surface. So yeah, it has to be a, a, a reasonable level. But so in other words, don't use a very low value on thinking like, and certainly don't condemn a bridge on the basis of that unreasonable value. Uh, but that, not, not perhaps not a super clear answer, but it, it's looking like it's less important than we probably thought it was ten years ago. Yeah. They are just conscious of that rubbish in, rubbish out uh, situation where it might have an incredibly sophisticated tool, but it's only as useful as the information that you put into it and how mm -hmm. reliable that information is. And mm -hmm. that ULS, if the soil properties are, are quite crucial, um, and maybe that should go hand in hand with, with potentially using the tool. Yeah, so it's, 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 again, it's a useful, useful point, and we'll, we'll bear that in mind. Thank you. Um, John Richards, Gwyneth Council. So it's probably a fringe case and you know we've covered skew arches to some degree but I've assessed a, or I tried to assess a bridge that is square spanning but it's the road that's skewed by about 60 degrees. It's borderline a sort of railway tunnel. Um, as far as the 3D modelling assessment goes, how do you suggest that was approached? I mean, I guess an old school way of doing it would be to just have a different slices, wouldn't it? And have one slice, you've got a point at the quarter span, you know, it's it's yeah, somewhere different. And that, that's a lot of conservative, but probably over conservative. Um, but, but but when it comes to, um, I mean, I think we need to, we're engineers, we need to be pragmatic. I mean, the, the classic thing is if you've got a, a two way spanning concrete slab, and use some quick calculations and say that it's okay if you assume it's one way spanning. It doesn't really matter how it really works. You've done enough. So similarly, if you if you do a conservative assumption and it's fine, there's no problem. What is more of a problem is is when you know the seventy percent of cases when it's not quite fine and you know that you've got an imperfect model. I mean, certainly uh, when it comes to things like the um, the enhanced ring tool, I think that would be really good potentially dealing with a case like that. Um, Thank you. Hello, Suzanne Johnson from Curtins. I had uh, two questions, but the first one was what mortar do you use in the lab models? Is it more of a historic mortar or uh, modern mortars? Because I can imagine that would make a difference. Um, I, 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 it's, it's a one two nine mortar, so it's a lot mid link mortar. Uh, however, uh, I'm sure for this will be will be would love to tell you more about that uh, in tomorrow's um, tomorrow's talk. Okay, I'll ask the question then. Uh, the second part was the load on the barrel compared to on the voussoir arches. Um, I was looking through the documentation, and it's not entirely clear how the load should be distributed between the two so have you used that in the analysis or 
the work you're doing now about the difference between the barrel vault and the voussoir where they're not necessarily very well bonded? So, so you, you're talking about in a, a stern voussoir arch, for example, where you've got the full, the voussoir is the full depth yeah. compared with a multi-ring brickwork arch, for example. Uh, or where the barrel is less depth than the voussoir arch on the ah, case. You, you, you mean it's misleading. You've got the, the, the elevation has got voussoirs here and you, and you, you look inside and it's Exactly, but then if you look on plan, they don't necessarily bond in very well. So this is something I come across all the time on uh, masonry arch bridges in the yeah. countryside. And so it's very difficult to analyze. You almost have to separate them into a 2D arch on the front and a 2D arch on the side, but with different properties. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean there's a question about um, looking at the backfill property. What, what I, I found... Um, really useful is, is is perf penetrometer just actually drilling a hole through the black top and then putting a basically dropping a a weight in a pole and you can see very easily what the the depth is without actually doing any intrusive I mean obviously you can drill through the, the barrel but that, that's 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 more um damaging to the masonry so obviously obviously you, we, we need to know what the thickness is in order to do a, a reasonable analysis um I, I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure if that's what, exactly what you're asking, but uh, I guess the question was between the two, the code isn't very clear on the loading on one compared to the other or the interface between the two. So I think there was there is one section where you can apply a section of the load onto the external arch, but it it doesn't really define. We probably need to talk about it separately. So I'm not sure exactly what what, what you're saying. But uh, yeah, just wondered if it was part of okay. the message. Thank you. Thank you.